we'll just give a little time for people to come in and join us. We'll just go at 10.03. Hopefully people will be ready and fully in by that particular stage. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So I think we'll, we'll start off. If anybody joins us a little bit later, then they'll just miss my intro. Um, but we'll get into the number thing. So uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, this particular session is about the uh, R&D regime changes that are coming for particularly the media and marketing sector. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't know me, my name is Rob Husband. I'm a media partner in the West End uh, office of the firm. And whilst I can see on the attendee list uh, a, a number of known names, um, for those of you that aren't aware of us as, as a firm, Moore Kingston Smith is a UK top 15 audit tax and advisory firm working across the corporate and the OMB market. We're also part of the larger uh, international network, more global, where we lead very specifically on sectors such as media and marketing firms for those businesses that are trading internationally. Um, so this particular session is focusing on R&D as a say for the, the media and marketing sector. And as some of you will already be aware, the government is changing uh, much of the R&D tax regime, stating that the changes are intended to increase productivity and promote growth in the UK. Several of the reforms are already announced, including bringing pure mathematical research within the scope of the relief. Not sure that that applies particularly to the media and marketing sector, but things such as the inclusion of data and cloud computing as qualifying cost now uh, are certainly relevant to, to this particular sector. There are some downsides to the changes, which include restricting expenditure on some overseas R&D activities. And also the government has brought in a level of measures which are there to target perceived abuse and improve the compliance within the claims that are actually made. Uh, so today we're gonna to talk to you about what you can do to uh, make your final preparations for the changes and how you may need to alter the way that you make your claim. I'm delighted to introduce uh, my two co-panelists today, Thomas Hayden, who is our R&D lead and director in the team, which comprises uh, a, a group of both technical and corporate uh, staff, corporate tax staff. Tom focuses on undertaking the relief claims, R&D expenditure credit claims, RDA and other innovation incentive claims such as grants. Uh, Tom actually works with clients of all sizes, highly innovative startups and also large household name corporates. To a certain extent, Tom is known internally as our very own Brian Cox, and he actually has a background in astrophysics. And from that, of course, has a deep technical understanding of the natural sciences and particularly engineering and computer science. Um, this uh, understanding of sciences gives Tom a in-depth technical, allows him to have in-depth technical discussions with R&D clients and his own team. And Tom was previously the UK technical director of one of the world's largest R&D innovation financing consultancies. Uh, during his career, he has managed to secure and make claims over many hundreds of millions of pounds of R&D. So uh, 
extensive uh, experience there within the panel. And additionally to Tom, Michelle Denny West, who is uh, a mixed tax partner, and in fact, they are lead in our entrepreneurial tax group. And Michelle has extensive experience in providing tax compliance and advisory services, both to entrepreneurs and owner managed businesses. And regardless of what stage they're at in their business cycle, startup or exit, uh, businesses can and individuals can rely on Michelle's expertise in the ever changing and complex tax rate regulation to provide sound advice. Um, so uh, just moving through the just after a short intro there, um, what we'd like to do is this is really a, a Q&A session. Um, so please, if you wouldn't mind putting the uh, any questions that you have, we have some to, to work our way through. But if you have any specific questions, if you can put those into the chat function and then I can relay those out to the team. Because this is an online webinar, I don't need to give anybody any details relating to any potential fire alarms that may occur during the, the session. So hopefully we won't get into interrupted on that basis. So we're going to jump straight into the Q&A session and I'm just going to open with a uh, uh, question for Tom and that is um, what is the current R&D tax regime and how that's working at this moment in time? Yeah, thanks, Rob. And, and thanks for the uh, comparison to uh, Brian Cox. I, I quite like that. Hopefully it's that's as a result of the... Delighted to give it. Oh, thank you. Uh, hopefully as a result of the astrophysics background, as opposed to all the staring into space that I do. But uh, um, cool, R&D tax. So so what is it? What's it all about? Um, it's a, it's a wonderful incentive. May, a, a lot of businesses in the UK make use of this already. Um, not everyone knows everything about it, and there is a lot of changes coming up. But uh, what exactly is it? Well, it's, it's an incentive to encourage you to do more research and development. So it essentially mitigates some of that risk that you undertake when, when, when doing what we define as research and development. Um, so I guess the first question there in a way is what is research and development? So um, uh, it starts with a fantastic phrase full of jargon, um, which is a, a project that seeks to achieve an advance in a field of science or technology through the resolution of scientific or technological uncertainty is R&D. Um, as I say, full of jargon. So what does that mean in practice? Uh, well, essentially, a business that is making some sort of step change, so starting from a baseline with regard to that science or technology, and is making some sort of improvement above that baseline, um, will be essentially seeking some sort of advance. Um, and in order to do that, they need to be overcoming this level of uncertainty. So how do you go about doing this? Or is it possible to actually achieve it? And that, that, that uncertainty, another way of looking at it is sort of technological risk. It's the risk that businesses, business faces when they are attempting to um, do uh, R&D. Um, so... Going back to that original what it is, well, it's a way of mitigating that level of risk that you face. Um, so what can a business get back um, as a result of making these claims? Um, it, it would depend on whether they're a large company or an SME. And Michelle is going to go through this in a, a, in a bit more uh, detail because there are some changes on this and there's some changes to uh, the generosity of the scheme. Um, but previously, it was very, very generous on the SME side. And, um, you know, we were talking you know, up to a third of what companies spent on this on this certain type of, of development activity they could receive back. Um, Rob, does that sort of answer your question overall as to uh, what R&D is? Yeah, I think what would be great, Tom, is just to uh, give some context to the level by which the uh, movement of the baseline actually has to occur. So people are aware of what we're talking about, particularly in technology and the technologies that they use within their own business whether it's specifically a changing process 
or how, how they're going to measure that and how the inland revenue would actually measure that? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, focusing this on the sort of marketing and media businesses that, um, that, that we're discussing today, I would say there's, there's, there's many levels to, uh, to a project that a marketing or media business would, uh, um, would typically undertake. And at the top of that, the, at the highest level um, within marketing and, and, and media, et cetera, you're generally trying to gain some sort of engagement from a third party of some sort with a, with a project. So you're trying to build something that can achieve something that increases the number of customers or um, gets more people to see something or means that the advertisements or what you're doing is more focused on the right customers. And that's your... That's not your technological um, advance that you're seeking. That's your, your sort of overall commercial advance. That's your advance within marketing technology. But actually, if you delve one layer below that, um, you'll start to see that it focuses more onto the technology itself. So what technology is underpinning that, uh, that, that marketing advance as such? Um, and when you start inspecting that itself, what are the specific functionality, the capabilities within, for example, software engineering that you are having to improve in order to create the capabilities that can then achieve your, um, your marketing goal? It's so one of the, the, the mistakes I often see that are, that, that are made by companies by focusing on that top layer and not layering it back down to the technology itself. So looking at what HMRC would look for there, they want to see that there is uh, an element of knowledge or capability within, for example, software or computer science or perhaps a different field of science or, or, or technology. But um, specifically for marketing, it's generally going to be software or computer science. They're going to want to see there's a there's there's a knowledge or capability. You're stepping beyond that knowledge or capability. You're trying to enhance that knowledge or capability for the field as a whole. Um, so the field of software engineering or computer science and not the field of marketing or media, uh, which I think is a key distinction. Thanks, Tom. That's, a, that's really useful. Um, we have got a question, which I'm just going to hold uh, uh, just for a second. But uh, Michelle, if you could perhaps give us um, some detail, particularly on the current SME regime and how that is uh, currently framed, that would be really useful. And then I'll come back to uh, the question that we've got about data and cloud costs. Excellent. Yes, so the current SME regime is, as Tom mentioned, is getting much less, unfortunately, much less favourable. But if we look at the moment, the way the small, medium-sized entity will get relief, they get an additional tax deduction effectively. So up until the 31st of March, this month, 2023, so for the next month or so, for every £100 an SME spends on qualifying R&D expenditure, they will get an additional tax deduction of £130. And once you unravel that and you go through the sort of tax side of things, that normally equates to about 24.7% benefit. And I should point out that's for profitable entities. I'll come to loss-making entities in just a second. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite, you know, it's, it's quite a decent chunk that people are getting, you know, able to get a tax deduction for, which is quite helpful. Um, from the 1st of April 2023, I know we're going to go on to the proposed changes a little bit later, but I want to point out actually the way the changes are being made, that is now dropping, assuming that somebody, the same entity will be now be taxed at 25% incorporation tax rather than 19%, because that's one of the other changes coming in, that credit will drop, drop from 24.7% down to 18.6%, so it's a massive drop there on the small medium sized entity side of things. So again, it's going to be, I think, quite um, yeah, quite a material impact for some individuals, also sorry, businesses. For loss-making entities, unfortunately, the position is actually a lot, a lot more, you know, the changes are going to be much more catastrophic in that sense. So for loss-making entity, they get a repayable tax credit. So again, for every 100, 100 um, pounds you spend on qualifying expenditure, you get 130% of that expenditure, so 130 pounds, which you'll get a repayable tax credit for uh, currently up to 31st of March, 14.5%, which can, again, for every 100 pounds you spend, can result in like 33 pounds, 35 back in the, the, you know, the pocket of the business. But from April 2023, that's dropping quite significantly. So that so overall, it works out, you only get an 18.6% credit overall. So again, that's nearly halving. It's going to be quite, yeah, it's going to be quite, um, I think quite an impact, particularly on those that do rely on a lot of the sort of software side of things. 
Um, it says worth pointing out that the SME regime is currently quite complicated. And again, we'll go on to the changes a bit later, but we are expecting, and again, there's been announcements in the, um, from the government more recently that the SME regime will move and actually start to move closer towards the, what's called the RDEP for the large company scheme. Again, we'll come on to that a bit later. But it's all worth being aware. So at the moment, we, for the SME entity is very much about getting additional tax deduction is the way it works. So, so Michelle, that's just translating back into to, to layman speak the difference between the existing 130% deduction, which yes. has been reduced yes. down to 86, and that's the impact for businesses and yeah. the, the, the cash benefit that they would actually get on that side. Yes, exactly that. Um, and the 86 you know, um, percent drop is um, quite, quite significant. And if you look on the for the loss making companies at the moment, they get 14.5% tax credit. Um, that is actually dropping to 10% for those, which is why for loss-making entities, it's it's actually where you're using that R&D funding and that credit as part of your, you know, be able to, your working capital moving forwards. That's where the biggest loss is going to be seen. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, Tom, uh, a further question for you, which is really, um, if, you, if you wouldn't mind just outlining some of the proposed changes and particularly... Um, in, in my intro, I talked about the fact that they have actually brought in some costs that are now allowable. They've opened the field up in, in a certain way. And also there are some changes coming in terms of what's happening, particularly with international uh, partners and international tech hu hubs. Um, and particularly, we've got a question here as to how um, the revenue will perceive those data and cloud costs and whether those costs will be allowed in their entirety so perhaps if you could just uh, take uh, the audience through through that particular area absolutely so um i will thus finish on the uh, on the uh, data and cloud costs question because uh, i think there's a slightly longer answer to that but um starting in in, in no particular order otherwise um uh, the loss of overseas expenditure. Uh, so that's one of our, our, our first and most major changes, I would say. Uh, so what does that mean? It, it means that if you are uh, spending money on externally provided workers or subcontractors that are undertaking that work overseas, then you will no longer be able to include those costs within a claim. Um, so there are some caveats to that rule, but I would highly doubt that there uh, will be very many companies that will actually be able to utilize those, those caveats. Um, so some of the examples that are used are, for example, if you're doing uh, active volcano research and you thus can't do that within the UK, as, as far as I'm aware, there are no active volcanoes here. But I would also add that uh, I'm not sure there are that many companies in the UK who are doing active volcano research. Um, so uh, if, if, if there is an argument that, uh, that, that there is no possible way of you doing that research in the UK, then, then perhaps you can, uh, you can use those caveats, but um, otherwise overseas expenditure is essentially out. Now that's gonna have a massive effect on a lot of technology businesses because it is, it is very much the norm to use uh, developers from overseas countries, particularly where uh, it's perhaps cheaper than the UK. And I don't think, um, you know, getting roughly 20 to 30 percent back on your on your expenditure is going to change that for most businesses because the cost difference is far greater than that. Um, and, you know, businesses will already have agreements with uh, with developers in place. So moving to a different set of developers or a different uh, subcontractor is also a, a, a big cost to a business. So that's the first one, the loss of overseas. Um, our second change, as mentioned before, is, is the rates. We've gone through that one already, and, and Michelle is going to go through the uh, uh, increase to, to the R&D expenditure credit uh, uh, rates later as well. Um, so our third change is the need to pre-notify your intention to make an R&D claim. Now, this is a really interesting one because uh, it's never been required before and the rules to it seem to 
not really quite fit with other accounting and tax rules. So um, the idea is that within six months of the year end that you wish to uh, make a claim for, if you haven't made a previous claim uh, in the last three years, um, then you will need to notify HMRC of your intention to make an R&D claim. Now, it's a, it's essentially an anti-avoidance uh, rule. This It's to minimise the... Uh, um, the amounts of uh, fraud or boundary pushing that uh, the government and HMRC believes may be occurring in the industry. Um, but what it does mean is that particularly within marketing, where you might not necessarily always be doing R&D projects, you might be doing a specific project for a while, and then you don't do any projects that would meet that definition for a few years, um, it means that companies need to be thinking about this as they're doing their R&D, as they go along. Um, because it might be that by the time your accountant comes to you, so by the time, for example, Rob says to you, oh, I think that might be R&D, maybe you should speak to Tom, um, you're already a you know, approaching that six month point um, after that financial year end. So you need to be thinking about it at, at, at day one. Um, so that's the third of our changes. Um, the next of our changes um, that I think is worth talking about uh, is, is that the, the data and cloud costs inclusion. So I will go through the answer to that question we've received there. Um, but uh, from uh, for periods that start after the 1st of April, 2023, um, you'll be able to claim for cloud computing costs and the cost of data. Now, these costs are costs in relation to your research and development. Um, that's defined by the activities that go into collectively, uh, sorry, collectively serving to resolve those scientific or technological uncertainties. Now, what I know a lot of businesses have been doing is, is looking at their, their accounts and going, oh, we've spent half a million pounds on AWS costs. So we're going to be able to claim for those. Um, and that's not necessarily the case because your AWS costs probably are not divided. Um, just for clarity here, AWS is uh, Amazon Web Services. So that would be a cloud computing cost. Um, they're unlikely to be divided between your uh, research costs for that, so the cost of creating sandboxes, et cetera, and the costs uh, for you doing your business as usual work. So that might be you know, having clients on your platform, essentially what you're selling to other people. So you'll need to be able to come up with a uh, an appropriate apportionment to those costs before you can include them. Um, now that's going to depend on the business. You know, if you're if you're early stage in that development and you're only using that cloud computing cost for R and D because you know it's not a commercial product yet that you're developing, then you know it's likely to be the whole of that cost. Um, but for a lot of businesses, it's you know probably only going to be a small percentage of it. You know, say it's five percent, ten percent, something like that that will be able to be included. So what I would say from that, going back to that original question, you know. How are you going to go about doing that? How are we going to, you know, work out what percentage of uh, of that cost is going to be included? Um, it will be case by case, and you need to come up with um, something appropriate based on the scenario at hand. So, some level of apportionment, Tom, and also, of course, thinking about this stuff at the outset. Yes, is it a defined project that you're pursuing in the first place? Have you done some uh, scenario testing and forecasting as to whether uh, a particular project has a commercial positive as far as the business is concerned and therefore collecting the data as you go through? That's the, the background advice. Yeah, and, and, and Rob, that's a really good point and one that I would highlight and recommend to any business who thinks they might be doing R&D at any point. Um, Keeping records as you go will make it much, much easier when you come to actually making that claim. Um, and in particular, if HMRC have further questions on that. So uh, I would certainly recommend 
for for businesses to to you know perhaps it's a monthly basis perhaps it's a quarterly basis have a look at, at what you're doing write down some notes write down some rough apportionments to what's been being used who's been doing the work um just think about it as you go along um it's going to make your life much easier and also you're likely to be able to claim more that way because you're going to be able to justify more of it Really good. Um, very, very useful, Tom. Thank you. Um, and again, just just in terms of why do we actually think the revenue are moving in this particular direction as far as the UK R&D regime is concerned, particularly uh, the way that they're teeing up the SME scheme and removing you know, at a time where, of course, we think that we need jobs here in the UK? Yeah, I think I think there's two sides to this. Um, naturally, there's there's you know the, the the government doing what the government does, which is finding cost efficiencies in in what they're paying out for various things. And I can certainly see why when they look at the the figures that were there, um, and I'm going to say were uh, in terms of their figures because they did change, and it became a, a slightly prettier picture than it than it was previously. Those figures that were there, which showed that, you know, you were talking sort of 40% or something like that of, of, of the amount that is paid out in R&D credits going towards um, essentially R&D that occurs overseas. And for a scheme that should be encouraging uh, businesses to do R&D in the UK, it makes sense that they might want uh, to encourage businesses to, to actually hire people in the UK uh, to do this work. The other side to that, though, is is particularly when they are reducing the generosity of the scheme uh, simultaneously. I don't really see how this is actually going to have the desired effect that they're looking for. So realistically, I think the only effect it's going to have is just to reduce the amount they're, they're, they're spending on incentivizing R&D, which I would say given the overall goals to make Britain a you know, science and tech superpower, um, that we hear quite often is uh, probably slightly misguided. But then that's what I would say, being a professional in, in R&D. Uh, so the other side to this being um, that there is a view uh, within government um, and within HMRC that it, there is a significant amount of boundary pushing and also some fraud in the R&D tax uh, space. Um, and I, I think they have a point. I think there has been boundary pushing by uh, by some in the industry, normally due to uh, a sort of lack of understanding of what the legislation actually says. Um, I also think that it's due to a lack of policing of the scheme from HMRC. Um, I question whether they should be focusing more on better policing of the scheme, better raising of awareness of exactly how the rules fit, um, real life examples, as opposed to punishing the legitimate claimants that there are out there who are, are just trying to create the best technology they can, which is great for UK PLC. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good point, uh, Tom, and I sort of, sort of reflect back half, half a dozen years or so ago where the when the new SME regime came in to full force, um, probably at that point, Philip Hammond put, I think, uh, quantification and the stats were that the R&D claims in the SME market were around half a, half a billion a year, and that's now accelerated to about eight billion a year for the the, the exchequer and probably that's part of the focus but if we take it that that's a small part of the wages and salaries that are generated how, how does that fit together with sort of the international space and whether it's then worth our uh, clients and the international networks that we're uh, dealing with here as far as the media and marketing space uh, how, how does that all fit together in, in a context yeah I mean the it used to be uh, until these change, well, the, the changes technically haven't come in yet, but uh, it used to be that the UK was, you know, possibly one of the best in in in, in the world, um, or hold, certainly holding its head high in comparison to uh, 
other worldwide schemes. Um, but with some of these changes that are, are, are coming in, I'm, I'm not sure that we could argue that is the case anymore. So if we compare it to, for example, the, uh, the, the, the French scheme, um, the French scheme, you're getting back 30% of, of what you spend on R&D. Um, and that is is going to be significantly higher than than what there is in in the UK. But on top of that, the French scheme has uh, uh, some nice quirks that, uh, that that can be really helpful to, um, to 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 businesses. So, for example, when we talk about the overseas expenditure, um, you can have a, a, a reg sorry a registered subcontractor there who. Um, uh, who who sits in an overseas uh, country, so for example in the UK, um, which allows you to claim expenditure for that overseas uh, registered subcontractor, brings a, a, a few benefits in, in, in my opinion that um, firstly that that overseas registered subcontractor can, can then uh, argue some sort of commercial advantage when they are pitching for French work um, because the business knows it's going to be able to claim for that expenditure. Um, but also it gives the government more insight. So so potentially that's uh, that's an area the government could look at doing to, uh, to, to sort of bring us in line internationally. But um, overall, I think the UK is... is certainly after these changes it won't be holding its its own in the same way as it did previously with uh with with some of these overseas schemes great stuff thank you thanks tom um so so michelle just coming back to the sme scheme and uh it, its current positioning is there a point where sort of the sme claim is not valuable for um media and marketing clients yeah, that's a good question. So actually, it's a question that's actually been asked quite a lot since the rules were changed. Um, but to be honest, if there's like to be a net benefit, it's, it's worth considering making a claim. Um, because at the end of the day, whilst whilst the, um, the tax benefit you're getting now in terms of cash in your pocket has been reduced, actually, there is st it's still quite a generous scheme, although not as generous as it, you know, as it previously has been. Um, obviously, with that, you need to weigh up the co professional costs of making a claim and also actually your, your personal time costs in terms of the, the business itself. Um, but again, it's always worth exploring that. So all what I would say is make sure you speak to your advisor, speak and get their viewpoint. Um, either you're going to be an entity which typically has previously made R&D claims, so you'll probably have a feel quite quickly as to whether or not, you know, you should be continuing to make them. Maybe you have been doing them previously and are still doing R&D. My gut would say, yes, you should be continuing. If you haven't previously made an R&D claim, obviously, I think it's a bit, it's a bit more, um, oh, probably a bit more scary to now dip your toe into the water, given the current regime and the current, you know, focus of HMRC and everything else. Um, but again, I would just say seek professional advice. And actually, there is an advanced assurance um, process. If it's the first time you're making a claim, you're not sure, even if what you've got qualifies, then make use of advanced assurance. Thing. And again, your, your advisor or accountants will be able to help you with that. And what that assurance does is HMRC will tell you, provided, you know, you've done everything you said you've done, the costs are what they say they are, whether or not it would, would, would be a successful R&D claim. Um, so I'm still probably not answering the question quite as, you know, as black and white as you'd probably like, but it's very much, it's going to be a case by case basis. But if you can, if there is a net benefit to it, that's definitely worthwhile. So, so the advanced assurance, Michelle, how, how does that particular regime work uh, for, for people rather than just putting a claim in directly? Yeah, essentially you are contacting HMRC ahead of time to say, look, we're making an R&D claim for the first time. Will we qualify? Will we get relief? Or are you going to kick back and say no? Um, that's probably the yeah, very high level synopsis of it. That's essentially basically you're, you're checking up front before you, before you submit that tax return with that claim on. Okay, so is it is it's about risk risk mitigation yes, as yeah. far as the clients yeah, again, are concerned, just yeah. in case the money is paid out to you and agreed by HMRC, um, and therefore it's not yeah. a requirement. I should add. So, so if it's the first time you make an R&D claim, you don't have to go for the insurance. It's more there, yeah. Just just that double check and that risk mitigation on your side. And and the advance assurance lasts for a period of time, or is it you have to keep going back and doing that year, year on year? It's normally just a one, it would be a one off because it is normally for, again, Tom, please jump in if I'm, if things Yeah, are so, it's just so um, you get free, free financial periods or, or free tax periods as such um, from your advanced assurance. Um, but it's a one off, as, as uh, Michelle says. So you can't do an advanced assurance and then 
um, three years later, do another advanced assurance. I would also add, um, it, it, it's fantastic for those businesses who, who aren't necessarily sure, um, and they can go and fill out a, a technical description of what they're doing and, and know that HMRC has signed it off. And, you know, also their investors know that uh, know that this has been looked at and signed off. So it's great for that, uh, from that perspective. What it doesn't do, uh, this is often a, a misconception here, it doesn't negate the need every year for you to assess your R&D and write a report explaining how it's R&D. Um, because what you're getting from it is, is essentially HMRC are, aren't going to investigate you or look into you if the R&D claim you put in is in line with what was agreed at the beginning. Um, and the only way for HMRC to know it was in line is if you write a report explaining how it's in line with what was agreed at the beginning and how the costs are roughly in line, et cetera, et cetera. So you do still need to go through that same claiming process every year, um, but you can, you know, uh, for use of a better term, rest assured that should it be in line, you will be paid out. You're not going to hopefully go through a nasty inquiry process, which which I have to say, you know, uh, are nasty. Anyone who's experienced the inquiry process with HMRC uh, will have felt that. They go on for a long time and there are a lot of difficult, intrusive questions that will be asked. So, so if we think about that in terms of the use of the advance assurance, yes, those that aren't quite sure in terms of where they're going, but it can be a great way to think about um, a, a process to go through if you're in uh, a, a conversation relating to a merger or an acquisition where people are going to be coming to have a look at you for due diligence purposes because you've already got that. Or indeed, if you're raising money for uh, in the background where an investor may actually want to know whether you know those tax credits are going to come through and be rightly paid out if you've been through the process. So that's another very useful facet to going through advanced assurance. Yeah, yeah. So long as uh, you haven't made R and D claims before, etc. If you made R and D claims before, then then um, it's not going to be uh, the right route for you. Good stuff. Um, Michelle, give it, give, give, just talk us, so we have in the audience a, a number of large businesses as well, um, and, and you might want to just uh, tell them which ones of them are under the SME regime and which ones are under the larger scheme. But um, just give us some uh, insight as to what's going on with the larger businesses as far as R&D is concerned. Yeah, so for larger businesses, actually, if I just tell you first, actually, what falls, falls in the SME, SME scheme. So it would be businesses who've got employees, le le less than 500 employees, um, turnover less than 100 million euros, I believe, and a balance sheet total of less than 86 million um, it's tense if you're in that kind of ballpark, you're going to, you're going to fall on a small medium scheme and let, well, unless there's a reason that could be a reason you might have to claim the larger company scheme, but generally then everyone falls into the larger company scheme. I won't cover that part of it in more detail. So if you've got any questions on that, please reach out to us directly and we'll cover that off. Um, but for those who do fall into the larger company scheme, the tax relief is given in a very, very different way. Um, and on the face of it, it's actually more simple. There are some complications underneath the, the sort of skin of it, which you could end up getting involved with. But again, I won't cover those here today because I'll, I'll lose everybody very quickly and probably put everyone to sleep. Um, but so the larger company scheme, you get your tax relief by getting a taxable credit paid to you by HMRC. Um, so at the moment, up until the 31st of March 2023, that credit is 13% of your um, eligible R&D spend. And that 13% is then taxed at your current corporation tax rate, which will be 19%. And so you effectively get about 10.53% subsidy. So for larger entities up till March 2023, you will get about £10.53 back for every £100 um, you are spending. Um, from the April 2023, that is changing. And as we mentioned earlier, that's actually going to be more beneficial for larger entities. Um, so that tax credit is increasing from 13% up to 20%. Um, so for every £100 you spend, you get, you'll get sort of £20 back, but that will be taxable. Um, so assuming, again, because the corporation tax rates are changing from the 1st of April, as I'm sure many of you are aware, um, for, for most entities, that'll be now 25%. Assuming you're a 25% payer, you'll subsidy will now effectively be 15% rather than 10.53%. So it's almost like a 4.5% increase there in terms of what you get back on your R&D spend. 
Um, should mention there'll be some that are under the RDEX scheme who will still be paying tax at lower rates at the 19% rate. And again, your subsidy there will be closer to about 16, 16.2%. Um, so sort of just being aware. But again, it's just, it's, it is, it's more straightforward on the face of it. As I've mentioned, it's very much, you know, you make your spend, you get a credit back and you pay tax on that credit. Um, it's sort of literally as straightforward as that. And it's worth uh, remembering that it's likely the way it's going to go. The SME scheme is going to move into a larger company type, type of RDEC type scheme um, going forward at some point in the future. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, so so the, those uh, accounting entries, they, they fall a um, previously for the SME scheme, it's sort of effectively on the tax line, but now as far as the RDEX scheme, that, that sits in effectively in your profit and loss account uh, uh, above the tax line. So it, it has a different Im impact in terms of your EBITDA. Um, so that's something that people should be aware of and may, may be relevant to the S SMEs in, in the future. For sure. So, uh, with with all of these changes that are coming through, what should people be thinking about doing just at this moment in time, Michelle? Are there things that we can do that uh, helps to get a better deal for our clients? Yeah, it's all it's all about the planning. Um, to be honest, and getting an understanding about you know, understanding how these change rule changes are actually going to affect you. If it's something. If you're a seasoned R&D pro, you know, you've made your claims every year, actually understanding if these changes, are they going to affect you, how they're going to affect your business, and actually what it means for you in terms of your cash flow planning and everything else. So again, talk to your advisor. And, and if you've never made an R&D claim before, again, it's all about the planning. If you've got that need in the background, you could be eligible, then ask the question. It's better to find out now and understand what, what it actually means for you, um, particularly given that the new notification process is coming in for those who haven't made R&D claims before, only having that six months at the end of the accounting period, and most won't file their tax return until you know, nine or 12 months past the end of the accounting period. That you need to be having those conversations now to know whether or not you should be making that advance notification. And again, if, you've, if you're a seasoned pro, you've made claims in the last three years, you're not having to worry about notification. But for those who haven't previously, I imagine a lot of people are going to become unstuck at that point. They're going to get to the end and they're putting together their, you know, their accounts and their tax return. They think, oh, great, we could have made an R&D claim, only to realise they've missed that notification um, procedure. So again, it's all about the planning and about talking to those yeah, who advise you. And probably something that for those that are audited um, sort of above the 12 million, that effectively there are thereabouts in terms of the turnover, they're actually building out that into their audit planning process for sure. Good stuff. So, so Tom, one one final question. I'm just conscious that we're getting towards the end of the session. You know, there, there's undoubtedly been quite a lot of bad press out there um, in in the market. Is is there a feeling that um, the the number and intrusivity of the inquiries that are going on, is that picking up as far as the inland revenue are concerned? Are you, are you shining a bad light on yourself by, by making a claim these days? Uh, uh, yes, there, there, there are a lot more inquiries being opened across, uh, um, across the country. HMRC have brought in... Um, you know, more than 100 extra inspectors or, or extra caseworkers, I should say, rather than inspectors, um, in order to open up these inquiries. Uh, there's also been a number of nudge letters that have been sent out to uh, to businesses. So these are, uh, are what they call one-to-many letters, where they essentially write a letter saying, you've made an R&D claim. Are you sure that it's correct? These are all the penalties, et cetera. And this is all our scare stuff to, to, to make you have a think about that. Um, so they are, uh, at HMRC are making a real concerted effort to, uh, to tackle uh, some of the issues that, that, uh, that there are in the, uh, um, in the industry as such. Um, I would say that uh, they're not wrong to do this. Um, there has been some, some unscrupulous advisors going around uh, pushing companies to make claims that uh, that are, are just simply not R and D. Uh, you know, an example of that that I, I I've I've read in the past that uh, that that has been marketed by an advisor is. Uh, uh, a company saying that care homes, each individual patient at a care home should be considered uh, an R&D project because each one is is a bespoke science 
to work out the right care package for them, which, as we all know, is absolute nonsense. So this is what... Uh, uh, this is what HMRC are dealing with and trying to cut out. And it's clear that government's given them a little bit of a kicking for this. Uh, but moving back to the inquiry side and, you know, should that prevent you from putting in an R&D claim? Nothing has changed from that perspective. Um, if you substantiate your claim well, uh, so if you produce a solid R&D report, um, you are not boundary pushing. So you're not, you know, going, oh, maybe we should just try it for this bit of expenditure, et cetera. Um, you're coming up with a prudent claim, et cetera, and you're doing solid R&D, um, then you're at no more risk than you ever were of, of uh, your claim being you know, rejected or reduced by HMRC. Okay, HMRC might ask some questions because they're more likely to do that because they've got more caseworkers. Um, but you will be able to answer those questions um, and HMRC will, will, will therefore be able to get the information that they need to, uh, to, to pay out your claim or to satisfy themselves if they have already paid out your claim and they're uh, inquiring after the fact uh, to satisfy themselves that they have in fact paid the right amount out. Um, so I would, I would suggest don't let it discourage any business from making a claim. But what it should do is make sure that uh, encourage you to think about things as you're going along, keep records as you are going along, um, and also seek uh, advice from agents that uh, uh, that are well respected and know what they're doing. You know. Uh, we might be one of those, but also, you know, there are others in the industry who are very, very good as well. Just to, just to be completely fair, doing my BBC impartiality. In fact, not on the BBC. No. Seek advice from us. Yes. Well done. Very good. <laughs> so I think the, the byword there for, for everybody is, you know, uh, undoubtedly the regime is, is changing. There are some opportunities, albeit very short term, for, uh, for some businesses in accelerating some activity over the course of the next month uh, to make sure that that expenditure is incurred before the end of March. For some other companies, it may be worth actually uh, in, in the RDEX scheme, perhaps even thinking about deferring some of that expenditure to post-April, post where the corporation tax uh, rates change and obviously the rate of the uh, credit in itself actually increases. So those are a couple of pointers to, to think about. Uh, by all means, come back to us, reach out to both Tom and Michelle if you've got any questions on your own specific circumstances and we'd be delighted just to have a no obligation chat on those particular areas. So um, I think the byword is uh, in further is um, look at what's happened in the past. Don't expect that to be the continuation for the future. Perhaps some further scrutiny from the revenue. Make sure that you're moving the needle on, particularly on the computer technology side, to make sure that you've got things that are happening there that aren't just about changing your internal process, because other people may be doing that in, in the background, such as CRM systems, even if they're bespoke. Um, Today's session has been recorded, I'm delighted to, to say. Um, so please feel free to share that with anybody else. And of course, it will be published and up on our website. Um, we'd be delighted to get some feedback from you all on what future sessions may be useful to you and whether you need any further detail on this particular area. Um, our next media sector um, webinar will be up and coming on the next budget and that will be run on the 21st of March at 10 o'clock which will again be by Zoom. So thanks to Tom and thanks to Michelle and also thanks to you all for coming on to the session. Hope it's been useful for you and if you've got as I say any feedback for us then we'll be delighted to pick up uh, on that in due course. So thanks for now. <laughs>